Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by the Center for ADHD Awareness Canada, CADAC. Tonight's topic for the webinar is tips for understanding the ADHD mind and navigating an adult ADHD relationship when you don't have ADHD. Our speaker for the night is Heidi Bernard. And um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, please enter them into the chat box below and we'll an answer them at the end. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Heidi Bernhardt. I'm the founder of uh, CADAC, Center for ADHD Awareness Canada. Uh, CADAC is the only Canadian charity focusing solely on ADHD. We provide leadership in education, awareness, and advocacy to improve the lives of families and individuals with ADHD across Canada. Tonight, we're going to be uh, speaking about understanding and successfully navigating an ADHD relationship when you don't have ADHD. Of course, if there are some significant other spouses um, listening to the presentation who do have ADHD, not to worry because the information will be just as pertinent and helpful to them as well. Um, as I said, I am the founder of CADAC, but I'm also the director of education uh, and advocacy. Um, just going to skip ahead to this one and then go back to the last uh, slide. So a uh, bit of a personal disclaimer. So yes, I founded CADAC and one of the reasons I founded CADAC was because I have three grown sons with ADHD. Uh, and I've been married for 46 years to a spouse with ADHD. And I consider that I'm still learning about ADHD and how it impacts those with ADHD. I wouldn't say daily at this point, but still probably weekly and uh, monthly. Now, also just to let everybody know uh, that um, this information that we are providing tonight is specifically an educational course it's for information purposes only, and it is not intended to be professional medical advice, diagnosis, treatment, or care, or anything like that. And please don't ever disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because something you've heard in uh, tonight's presentation. Um, so that's just to let you know the intention of this presentation. All right, we'll start the presentation. Okay, so tonight we're going to be talking about the first step uh, that you have to undertake to improve your relationship, and that's understanding ADHD. We're then going to be looking at dynamics of an ADHD relationship, how to begin to improve the relationship, tackling those roadblocks you're probably going to come up against. And then we're gonna look at applying specific strategies on improving the relationship. So step one, understanding ADHD. So what I always recommend, whether it's a parent of a child who's just been diagnosed, an adult who's just been diagnosed, or in the circumstances, to people in a relationship with ADHD, the first thing you need to do is learn about ADHD. What is it? What isn't it? Um, the symptoms it causes, the impairments it causes. And um, I recommend when you start the journey, take an academic approach. You're learning these things, but while you're learning it, try in the back of your mind to think about your partner with ADHD and the things you're learning, how those symptoms impact your partner specifically. Because remember, ADHD presents very differently in different people, okay? One person with ADHD may look very different than another person with um, ADHD. And try to think about specific impairments that the ADHD causes that trip them up in their daily functioning. And some tips on how to sort of figure out how these things impact them specifically is one, when you're involved in filling out all those wonderful diagnostic forms, which you should have filled out as the significant other for the adult with ADHD, that will give you a, a hint of some of the ADHD symptoms. 
join in as many of the appointments as you can, obviously understanding that some of them will need to be private, but hearing what the physician um, is sharing with your partner can be very beneficial. And remember, there's tons of resources on the CADAC website. There's webinars. We've got past film presentations from Dr. Berkeley and Dr. Brown on uh, ADHD impairments, and you can get to those all from the website. So let's look, about, uh, look at ADHD symptoms and how they affect a relationship. So obviously there's a tension dysregulation, right? So when you're interacting with someone else with ADHD, they're probably going to have uh, impairments in staying focused. But remember, attention dysregulation is as much over-focusing as it's under-focusing. It's all, all, also impairments in switching focus and prioritizing focus, okay? So your partner with ADHD uh, may be over-focusing, may not be able to break their focus from something they're finding very interesting to switch it to focusing on you when you're speaking to them. They may lose their focus and be distracted when you're speaking with them. Um, they can also become easily bored if uh, they're asked to be involved in something they don't find very interesting. Distraction is also a big part of this, but distraction can also be external or internal. And most people just think of external distraction. So obviously, you know, those are noises, people moving around uh, next to them, um, something that catches their eye while they're walking by, their focus becomes uh, centered on that and they totally forget what they're supposed to be doing. But distraction can also be those internal voices. A lot of adults with ADHD talk about having several um, discussions in their brain at you know the same time, or there can be daydreaming going on. Um, sorry, somebody's got their mic on and we're hearing them moving things. So can you turn off your or mute your sound? Um, also, there's hyperactivity. So uh, yes, we have restless bodies, but very often as people move into adulthood, a lot of that decreases. You may see some of the, you know, leg jiggling, hair twirling kind of thing, but, uh, or sometimes pacing, that kind of stuff. But a lot of adults talk about having a restless mind, right? And their mind is constantly busy and they find it very difficult uh, to relax. Impulsivity is uh, something else that causes great difficulty. We can have impulsivity in speech, you know, in the mind, out the mouth, without the filter being there. We can uh, have impulsivity in actions, uh, which causes problems in relationships. Uh, definitely impulsive spending can really be a big uh, issue if that's there. And very often these impulsive acts are misinterpreted as a person being uncaring or irresponsible when that may not be their intentional, their intention um, at all, right? So then we look at impairment in executive functioning, which frequently comes with ADHD. So things like lack of organizational skills, which will impact um, getting their household duties done, paying bills, can often lead to uh, being very um, disorganized, messy, losing things, and disorganized to the point, point of hoarding. And in speaking to actually one of my own sons with ADHD, and I said, my God, how come you never throw anything out? And he said, I'm paranoid of throwing out the wrong thing because in my brain I can't figure out what's the right and wrong thing so I just keep everything just in case I might need it right so again you can see how that might lead to uh, chaos and eventually hoarding so the inability to follow instructions uh, can really get into, in the way sometimes in a relationship. You can imagine a wife uh, saying to her husband as he's going out the door, remember you have to leave work at five o'clock today. 
because you have to pick up uh, these um, groceries and drop your checks off of the bank and you have to pick up Susie at ballet at six, right? Do you think the adult with ADHD is going to remember those list of instructions? Most likely not, unless they're put in a day timer, they're written down, all of those things. And again, forgetting is often misinterpreted as the person not caring, not being responsible. And again, that is not what's behind this. Forgetting routines, appointments, promises, Again, interpreted as being unreliable. Um, difficulty in following schedules, routines, what's been decided on as parents uh, can be very, very destructive to a relationship between uh, significant others as well as between child and parent because we get very inconsistent parenting. Difficulties in time management, always being late, missing deadlines, uh, you know, lack of a schedule, um, all of those things cause problems. And um, very often adults with ADHD have impairment in social skills. They will have difficulty with picking up those subtle signals that we all give, you know, unintentionally the body language, the facial expressions. We know that children with ADHD have great difficulty picking up on a, the angry face. So very often teachers will be giving them the evil eye and they, they are totally oblivious. Well, this leaks over into adulthood as well. So we have to be very cognizant that this missing of uh, picking up of social skills can be quite common. Some, uh, another impairment that people know about a little less, but in recent years has been really um, in the forefront of ADHD research uh, and papers is what we call emotional dysregulation. So it is now considered a core symptom of ADHD, even though it's not in the DSM-5. Um, and very often the adult with ADHD is unaware. They may be aware that they have great difficulties with anger and frustration and remaining calm, but they don't know that it is caused by the ADHD. So adults with ADHD can become easily frustrated. When they are frustrated, they're unable to deal with that frustration in appropriate or constructive ways. They're more easy to anger um, and they can become unintentionally what appears aggressive to other people, although they may not be aware of it. So the loud voice, the looming present, overly persistent, like constantly pushing um, their point on something. Again, a part of this emotional dysregulation and not picking up on social, uh, social skill cues. Um, so they may be totally unaware they're speaking loudly and scary. And we have to learn to be better at um, sharing that with them in constructive ways. Um, meltdowns can occur just like they do in kids with ADHD. Um, adults with ADHD can have meltdowns too, but of course uh, in adults they can be scarier. Um, very often the non-ADHD partner, and excuse the terms, but it's the easiest way to sort of talk about this. So we will have the ADHD partner and the non-ADHD partner. So very often for the non-ADHD partner, they can feel that they're walking on eggshells emotionally, right? And this can be physically exhausting. And they're walking on eggshells because they're never sure what is going to trigger this frustration or um, aggression uh, meltdown in their partner. And in my estimation, this can be one of the most destructive things in a relationship. So some other things that we see in adults with ADHD that can um, cause difficulty in a relationship is what we call self-medicating with argument. So we know the ADHD brain craves stimulation. 
So some people with ADHD provoke arguments or drama, usually unconsciously, but it, it, it increases adrenaline. So anger, upset, negativity, opposition, all of those things cause an immediate adrenaline surge in the brain, okay? Adrenaline in the brain helps someone to feel focused and calm, at least someone with ADHD to feel focused and calm, okay? And because this dysfunctional pattern is rewarding over time, it's reinforced. So what do I mean by that? So when the adult with ADHD provokes an argument or drama, and they get this adrenaline surge and their partner argues back, they get this reward, they get the adrenaline surge, which reinforces this behavior over time, right? So, and these type of behaviors can occur anywhere with an adult or with anyone, but generally an adult with ADHD is cognizant enough to know that there's a lot bigger risk doing this type of behavior with their boss than with their significant other. So we see it a lot more with sort of family members, significant others, um, you know, people who can't easily leave. If you do it with a friend, they can walk out much easier than your spouse. So, and if those around the person with ADHD who's doing this behavior tries to ignore the behavior, sometimes it just escalates the behavior, especially if neither partner is aware of what is happening. Because generally, if they're seeking the stimulation and they're not getting it, they will up the ante. So some other things that we see in adults with ADHD that can impact a relationship is worry or anxiety. So we know that 25 to 40% of adults with ADHD have anxiety issues. So worry is generally more targeted. So you're worrying about a specific thing when anxiety can be more generalized. So again, the ADHD brain seeks focus, right? So and Ned Hallowell uh, talks about worry and anxiety providing a riveting focus for the brain similar to pain, right? When you're having a very calm day, relaxed day, good day, <laughs> There is no adrenaline rush there. There's no adrenaline in the brain and there's no place for that brain to focus. But if you've got something to worry about, your brain can gnaw on it all day long. So perfectionism uh, is something else that we see with adults with ADHD. So they may have a certain view of something in their mind that is their their perfect finished product or their ultimate goal. Um, and they're continually striving for that. But we know that that ultimate goal or perfect finished product is almost impossible to reach, but they get stuck on the details and they do this thing over and over. We see this in kids erasing their work, constantly doing it over and over or sometimes they can get stuck on thinking about how to do something, right? So they can get paralyzed and continually be on this loop in their mind of trying to figure out a project or something at work or just a hobby, something um, they're doing. And we know emotional dysregulation makes these things worse. So the reason I'm mentioning these things is because in some relationships, this can be a real problem. So understanding where it's coming from and why it's there uh, is the, the first and best step to doing something about it. So let's look at step two, understanding the dynamics of the ADHD relationship. So this is a quote I like uh, from Melissa Orloff, who's considered an ADHD relationship therapist or coach. Um, she says, ADHD symptoms alone aren't destructive to the relationship. A partner's response to the symptoms and the reaction that it evokes is. So what do we mean by this? So it's not the symptom itself that's destructive. 
It's how the non-ADHD partner is interpreting what happened and um, judging it, laying blame to it, uh, deciding that it's intentional, the other person doesn't care enough, isn't responsible enough, doesn't love them enough, et cetera, et cetera. So they react in a certain way to that symptom or impairment. And then of course the adult with ADHD will react to their reaction in a particular way. And it sets up this ugly communication pattern. Okay, so we see this cycle that develops in these relationships. And very often the non-ADHD partner um, will lay blame until they know better as to where the, these things are coming from. They will get frustrated, they will get angry because things don't change and improve and they eventually withdraw. The ADHD partner, um, very often will downplay the severity. You know, what are you getting upset about? It's not a big thing. The room's a mess, so what? Um, there will be excuses, denials. Um, and remember, this, this is a pattern that's set up from childhood as well, and they will eventually withdraw. So we set up the, these negative patterns when we don't understand the underlying ADHD. So we typically see three stages to an ADHD relationship. So a new relationship, again, is novel, exciting, stimulating. And we know that people with ADHD are very drawn to these kind of things. They can very much hyper-focus during the courtship phase, which makes their new partner feel very loved and special. Uh, but eventually, the new relationship evolves into a not so new relationship. The hyper-focusing stops, which can cause a lot of feelings of confusion and hurt. Neither partner kind of knows what's going on. At the same time, uh, the impairments, ADHD symptoms become more evident. This misinterpretation and judging uh, gets set in and this is very often where we see parenting beginning and what do I mean by that so it means that the non-ADHD spouse starts parenting the spouse or significant other with um, ADHD and again not necessarily intentional on either part uh, but because, you know, they feel their partner is, you know, not following through, unreliable, et cetera, et cetera, they will begin the parenting and the nagging and the lecturing. Um, and the partner with ADHD becomes confused and defensive and angry because they don't really understand what's going on. And we're going to talk a little bit more about each partner's feelings in a minute. So basically what happens is this is how relationships break down. And I can't tell you the number of people I've spoken to um, who said, yeah, you know, had I known then what I know now, my marriage may still be intact. Or I am on the second or third marriage. I finally got my ADHD diagnosed. Now I understand uh, what's going on. And very often we find adults get diagnosed when their children are diagnosed. So hopefully um, it's early enough in this cycle so we can do some repair work. So some feelings of the non-ADHD partner. Uh, as I mentioned, when they move out of this new relationship phase, they start feeling ignored, lonely, unloved, unappreciated. Um, all of that attention that's been lavished on them goes away. A partner with ADHD can very often switch and be focused on a you know, new hobby or new job or whatever. And they're left sort of feeling very confused as to why did this person change? 
um, they can start feeling that they can't trust their partner. Their partner isn't that soft place for them to land because they feel they're not reliable. Um, they start feeling their partner just doesn't care enough. And again, remember all of these things are misinterpretations of what's actually happening. They can feel they're not being heard um, or their concerns are being discounted or downplayed. Uh, because remember the adult with ADHD, a lot of times they don't understand what's going on. Um, they feel that things are being blown out of proportion. And even if they have great intentions to change things, nothing changes because the underlying ADHD has not been diagnosed, dealt with, treated. So the same issues just keep coming up. They can feel very unfairly saddled, like they're the one who has to be responsible for everything. They have to take the load of the household, the uh, parental duties, all of those things. They start feeling resentful and uh, angry and they can feel very stressed and exhausted. Like they're carrying the entire load of everything. They have to be the responsible one. And on top of that, there can be that feeling of having to walk on eggshells to avoid those emotional outbursts. But again, we need to look at the feelings of the partner with ADHD, because remember, they're uh, most likely uh, just as confused, okay? So they're looking at a partner that they first got into a relationship with somebody who was probably very drawn to their um, impulsive um, type personality, uh, you know, very exciting, trying a lot of new things, whatever it was that um, drew that partner uh, to them. But now they're confronted with somebody that they think is trying to micromanage their life. They're a control freak. All of a sudden they're nagging them and they're not drawn to that spontaneity anymore because things have now become serious and the house needs to be looked after, bills paid, you know, parenting, all of those things need to happen so that spontaneity is not as enticing anymore. So very often this leads to the partner with ADHD just avoiding, avoiding everything, avoiding their partner, their kids, whatever, or uh, them saying what they, they think the other person wants to hear. Uh, and again, intentional or not intentional, they may have 100% um, intention of changing, that things are going to change. But again, if the ADHD is not diagnosed and treated, we rarely see that, even with full intention that things are going to change. Uh, they're probably hypersensitive to criticism. Remember, uh, they're an adult with ADHD who grew up as a child with ADHD who heard a lot of negative messages their entire life. They feel that they're continually unfairly judged and misunderstood. They can become resentful and deaf to criticism. And they feel overwhelmed that no matter how much effort they put into things, they're incapable of meeting their partner's expectations. So they just shut down and stop trying in some cases. They can feel very shameful, less of a partner, again, especially if we have that parenting going on. They can feel unloved and unwanted when, of course, like everybody else, they just want to be accepted and appreciated for who they are. So those are all the negative things. So let's now look at how to begin improving uh, ADHD relationships. So Assessment for ADHD and all other potential coexisting disorders is the first step. Adults with ADHD, 80% of them have another coexisting disorder going on. Anxiety, depression, uh, OCD, dysthymia. Dysthymia basically means sort of low level uh, depression. Most people just talk about it like feeling meh. There's no highs, there's no huge lows, but they don't get enjoyment out of a lot of things. 
Um, sometimes it's substance use. Um, there's uh, very often at least one or more coexisting disorders. So we need to get a proper thorough assessment to understand the profile and exactly what's going on here. Because if we implement treatments for one and not everything, we're gonna be spinning our wheels. And then we need to implement treatments, but we're also talking about psychosocial treatments and I'm gonna mention those in a minute. So again, we need education for both parties in this relationship about ADHD and how it impacts the individual, okay? Both partners need to be committed to change. The partner with ADHD needs to work on improving their functioning and taking responsibility for their own treatment. And the non-ADHD partner needs to be responsible for correcting their misconceptions and changing their own behavior because it always takes two to set up a dysfunctional relationship. So the first steps to improving the relationship you have to be able to accept that ADHD does impact your relationship. And don't wait until things are irreputable. I mean, you know, the earlier we can start on this, the better. Um, both parties have to realize ADHD is a medical disorder uh, with impairments, and we need to change our lens of how we look at ADHD in this way, right? So we have to start to view the problems we're seeing as impairments rather than judging the person for that, and then work as a team on following solutions to those problems. So uh, again, you have to change your view on what you're seeing as an intentional act. So forgive, forget the past transgressions. I know that's, that's easier said than done, but sometimes just going into it with that intention helps. I know in the relationship with my husband and I, um, once, um, we learned about ADHD, what was going on. Um, obviously I did most of the learning and then uh, gave it to him in what he used to call reader's digest versions um, per se. And obviously it happened when um, our boys were diagnosed. But uh, the simple step of him realizing that, yes, yeah, some of the things he was doing could be a hurtful not very, um, you know, helpful to situations or family life, or etc. And sometimes just the, yes, you're 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 right. I messed up on that one. I'll try to do better. Changed everything for the better. I wouldn't say 100%, but a heck of a lot. Rather than getting no way, you're just blowing it out of proportion, no big deal, which generally just caused my stress to increase, okay? And working harder on all of this doesn't help unless we put those first few steps in place first, right? So we have to stop blaming each other. Who's right and wrong is not as important as getting along and trying to work on these things as a team. Nagging and, sh and shaming doesn't work. Continual criticism, criticism is just demoralizing and nobody actually likes to be in a relationship with somebody who's demoralized and it's it just hugely destructive. So ADHD treatment, what we know about medication is that it can assist with attention, forgetfulness, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and emotional regulation. However, medication should never, ever, ever be the one treatment for ADHD. It can be part of a treatment profile. Medication is not always um, necessary depending on the um, severity of the ADHD, but it can be very helpful for the things that were listed. But again, we need the ADHD education and um, all the additional strategies we're gonna be talking about put in place. There's other things uh, for ADHD that can be very helpful 
cognitive behavior therapy, which challenges the sort of negative thought process we that people with ADHD can have while educating them about ADHD and how it impacts them. Research has shown that CBT therapy is particularly helpful in combination with medication because the medication allows for those windows of attention to be in increased um, so the CBT can be uh, more absorbed. Um, ADHD coaching can be very helpful for organizational organization, different strategies. Uh, sometimes anger management and marriage therapy can be helpful, but the reason ADHD expert is underlined is that you should never go into anger management and marriage therapy unless the therapist is also an expert in ADHD because it can be more harmful than helpful. You can imagine if you're in marriage therapy with a therapist who does not understand ADHD, there will just be more uh, blame assigned, more misunderstanding, right? So you have to have that ADHD expertise there as well. And we know that certain lifestyle changes, things like a good balanced diet, uh, not an elimination diet, um, just a good balanced diet is good for brain functioning. Um, you know, protein rich can be good, uh, good sleep habits, uh, more aerobic exercise, all of these things can be helpful for brain functioning. So let's talk for a minute about uh, roadblocks. Um, so you may need to, to introduce some self-care for yourself before you start the journey of trying to repair the relationship. So the non-ADHD partner and possibly both partners um, have probably been on a very, very much of an emotional roller coaster uh, ride, especially if they don't understand what's going on. There's probably a lot of confusion. Um, very often, um, the significant other of the person with ADHD will feel there's times they're questioning their own sanity because there's such a different view of what's happened or gone on. Um, they can feel very, very stressed, exhausted from carrying um, all of the load. There's probably been a lot of time spent arguing and being angry. And, you know, there's that questioning of, will things ever change? We're just doing the same thing over and over again, right? So um, this, these great stresses on emotion, um, you know, you, after being gone through that, you may have to take a little time to calm down, self-care, uh, you know, maybe see somebody yourself, start, I don't know, meditation, whatever, whatever, um, you know, helps to get rid of some of that stuff, that old blame and anger, so we can go into this process um, being hopeful and positive. So another big roadblock, what do you do if your partner with ADHD is in, an, is in denial? And we actually um, hit this roadblock a lot. Um, we frequently hear, no way, I don't have ADHD, or I don't even want to go to see somebody about this. Uh, you're crazy, that's not me. You know, I may be very, and the person may be very good at their job. It's what we call silos of excellence, especially if they have a strong, um, administrative assistant to keep them uh, on track and focus, but they can be very successful in their job and fall apart uh, in their, their home with parenting and household duties and all that stuff. It's not a structure. There's nobody there to organize them, you know, uh, and prop up all of those impairments they have. Um, so those with ADHD, we know have very poor awareness of their own impairments and how their impairments affect others. 
um, they can be oversensitive to what they perceive as uh, criticism. And as we mentioned, they can be argumentative. They can deny the label uh, and uh, very much so because they perceive it as criticism, right? So if they're denying that label, what you can do as a workaround is rather than using the label and talk about, okay, we need to uh, try to support this ADHD impairment or ADHD symptom, you could start by tackling the problem, right? So again, without blame, <laughs> choose an issue, right? And try to figure out a strategy to solve the issue, okay? You don't have to talk about it as an ADHD strategy, but also to do this, you may have to get an outside professional um, involved. Um, because very often, you know, if there is that denial and roadblock, uh, sometimes it's difficult to overcome. And you can always start with changing yourself first and how you react, because it always takes two to set up that dysfunctional relationship. If your partner's reasoning is that you are a control freak and you're causing all the issues because you don't want to relinquish control, well, relinquish it. Unfortunately, this may cause a few hard lessons to be learned, but be prepared to watch and, you know, step in before things too drastically happen. But sometimes um, it, it takes a wake up call. And just a, a um, really quick story. For adults with ADHD, uh, sometimes they don't take things seriously unless the situation is put to them as a very urgent emergency type of situation. It's easier for them to ignore it, procrastinate, put it off, that type of thing. So for a number of years, this, this, this was quite a few years ago, but for a number of years, uh, my husband was presenting uh, as being depressed enough so that my middle son actually commented on it. And I had been pressuring him probably for a year and a half or a couple of years to uh, go to see somebody about it, um, you know, do some reading about it, consider it uh, even. And there was always sort of denial, procrastination, no, 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 you know, that's not what it is to the point where um, I got so frustrated. I said, okay, you have the individual choice to live a life for your next, whatever, 20, 30 years of your life expectancy in depression. But what you have to realize is I also have the choice whether I want to share that life of depression with you. Um, of course, it wasn't done in that calm a voice, per se, but um, it turned the situation in his mind into an urgent situation. And he went to see the doctor. And about three to four months later, when the antidepressant medication kicked in, he said, oh, gee, you know, I wish I would have done this a long time ago because I just feel so much better at which point I had to stop myself from strangling him. But anyway, sometimes it takes that moving the situation into that urgency to wake them up. So let's look about at um, actually applying specific strategies. We're gonna start with general strategies and then we're gonna look at very specific things. So number one, do not take ADHD symptoms and impairments personally. And again, easier said than done, but it, the more you learn about ADHD, uh, the light bulb will go on and you'll go, oh my gosh, that's why she does that, you know, or, or that's why, you know, uh, he doesn't realize how annoying that is to me, or that's why she's, keeps forgetting to go grocery shopping, whatever it is, right? 
uh, the more those light bulbs go on, the more you learn about your spouse. And when you start to interpret things personally, stop yourself and rethink it. Okay, realize you can't control your spouse, but you can change the dynamics of the relationship. And the way you do that is by stopping verbal attacks, the blaming, the nagging, and also on the other part, stop with the excuses and ignoring the situation and start taking things seriously. Give positive feedback to your spouse as encouragement when you see even small bits of progress. Do not wait till the thing is 100% fixed. Well, one, it's never going to be 100%, but, but even a lot, because that's going to take a lot of work. Um, realize that that positive feedback, what we call positive consequences, uh, can very much encourage them to try harder. Make time for doing those enjoyable things together that you probably did at the beginning of your relationship, but may have gone by the wayside, just uh, lack of time, but also when the anger and the resentment sets in, um, generally people don't enjoy doing things together anymore, but make a concerted effort to do those things. And remember the fun things and the ADHD traits that you fell in love with because there's a reason that people are attracted to people with ADHD, right? They like the spontaneity. Um, very often people with ADHD can be very fun loving, very creative. Um, so try to remember those things um, along this journey. And this was actually uh, something interesting um, I read from a couple. They said that they had a rule that only one person in their relationship could be, quote, crazy at one time. So if one person was feeling extremely um, stressed, they needed to vent, um, they were whatever, very emotional, it was agreement between the two of them that the other one would step back for a while and say, okay, you vent, I will hold my own frustrating day in for a while until you get it all out, right? So it was, again, a way they negotiated their relationship uh, to work. So, and spend some time analyzing the things you frequently fight about, okay? Because the things we frequently fight about, it's never those things. There's always an underlying problem, right? And that's what we have to get at to solve and set up strategies for those problems for things to change. And um, if there's issues with embarrassing situations with social cues, um, talk about those as well. Uh, my husband's not particularly great at picking up social uh, cues. Um, so <laughs> we figured out the strategy uh, that, you know, when he was being embarrassing and not picking up that other people were getting annoyed or whatever, um, you know, we'd use this until we were at a dinner party and he announced to everybody that, why are you kicking me under the table? I don't understand. So you have to figure out these things ahead of time uh, and work out a plan, um, you know, that works. And it's funny, after the fact, when we would discuss whatever happened, uh, he'd go, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't realize I was doing that, but now that you mentioned that, yeah, I, you know, you should have told me. And I'm like, I try. <laughs> but anyway, figuring out, you know, a way to kind of get their attention to let them know um, whatever they're doing, you know, is not going over very well. So some more general tips. Do not become a parent, okay? Try to be supportive without taking over right and you may have to discuss this um you know and basically say when i start with the lecturing voice please remind me right but obviously do it you know have them do it in a nice way because you may not be cognizant that you've got that tone in your voice again 
Um, be aware and recognize your partner's limitations, okay? Um, but don't take up uh, all the tasks for them. You're just going to end up being resentful. Swap tasks, divide tasks, you know, try to balance, um, you know, get an equal balance of labor, but be sensitive to each other's strengths and weaknesses, right? Nobody, whether you have ADHD or not, is good at everything, right? So, uh, and people with ADHD can be very good, um, you know, at some things. So obviously you wanna divide those tasks equally so one person is not feeling overwhelmed. Um, realize you may need to take on the more time sensitive uh, duties or sometimes be what we call the closer to make sure things get done on uh, time. Uh, but also be open to your partner's unorthodox approaches. You know, the way you organize and plan or whatever may not work for your partner at all. But the way they do it may not work for you. So that's fine if you both have your own um, approaches to things. Uh, put issues in perspective, okay? Um, you know, deal with the things that are most important first. Not everything is urgent and a priority. And if you try to tackle everything at the same time, you're just going to fail. And tell your partner how to take care of you. And this was actually a hard lesson for me to learn because I expected my partner just to figure it out, just to figure out that what I found annoying, what I wanted him to do, how I wanted him to treat me. Um, you know, I expected him to pick up the subtle messages. Well, I can tell you that didn't work at all. And this was actually something he picked up on when our kids were young. You can imagine what it was like with a household with three boys with ADHD and a husband with ADHD. Um, I realized that as they got to a certain age, as soon as I stuck my head out the door, my bedroom door on a weekend, it was mom, mom, mom. So, uh, and one of my great joys is reading. And one of the best ways I read because of eye condition I have is without my contacts in bed. So we started uh, basically uh, me being able to stay in bed, not every weekend morning, but the occasional one for me to be able to read him to deal with uh, the kids. And he brought me breakfast in bed. And to this day, um, that's still uh, something to do. And he actually freely sh shares that uh, it's something he really enjoys doing because he feels that there's so much I do that it's something he can do for me and it makes him feel very good. So some communication strategies. We know that someone, when they feel they're not being heard, is extremely stressful. And this is the most common complaint we see in these relationships. And we mentioned this in, in several times through the presentation. We know that once the person feels heard, their stress level decreases. So, you know, teaching each partner um, to be able to express what they're feeling, but then also have the other partner repeat back to them what they heard them say can be very validating. Um, each partner needs to increase their uh, listening skills very often as the partner without ADHD uh, we can also shut down uh, uh, and stop uh, listening. So we need to be very aware of that. Uh, ask for repetition for both parties if your mind wanders. Uh, because I know sometimes my husband can get very involved in a very lengthy detail story. And I've learned as, you know, he's one, I've learned just to say, oh, okay, too much detail, you're losing me. Can we backtrack here a bit with, with less detail, right? Or um, I'll be talking and all of a sudden he'll stop and I'll go, oops, sorry, shiny object. 
I was distracted last year. Can you go back? And there's no judgment, right? So, and again, it's actually in some ways almost, uh, you know, a personal joke bet between us per se, because we've got comfortable with realizing we both do that. So make some time to sit down and talk face to face. Uh, but some people realize that some people find uh, email and text, especially if something is a very charged issue. Uh, some couples have shared with me that they find doing it over text or email less charged and uh, they can actually uh, work out some solutions that way. Just be careful that your messages are actually being interpreted correctly. One of the great problems we have with emails and text is messages are misinterpreted. And make sure you actually heard what your partner was saying to you and you understood it. And a good way, again, is repeating it back to you. Really quick story about a couple. Uh, the um, gentleman with ADHD, when he had a very stressful week found it um, very distressing to go to uh, a movie, um, you know, and just absorb himself in the movie on it on his own. So one weekend afternoon, he said to his wife, I'm heading out the door, I'm going to a movie, see you later. And the wife was busy kind of went, yeah, 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 see you later. So two and a half hours go by and she said, geez, that was an awful long movie. Where is he? You know, four or five hours go by and she's going, oh, gee, he must have stayed for two movies. So the, um, you know, after it becomes evening, she's stressed, she's called friends, she's ready to call the police, he waltzes in the door. And she, of course, at that point is beside herself, yelling at him, saying, where have you been? And he said, what do you mean, where have I been? I told you I was going to the movies. And she said, yeah, but look how late it is. And he said, I said movies. It was a, you know, a series of movies, you know, with so-and-so. Remember, I told you about that a couple of weeks ago. I said movies. Well, of course, she heard movie. He said movies and really one letter <laughs> created all of that havoc. So again, make sure you're actually understanding what your partner is saying because adults with ADHD can tend to word things quite differently, not correctly or incorrectly. It's just um, they tend to have a different way of saying things and very often there's misinterpretation there. So, some more communication strategies uh, for you. Uh, realize that your ADHD partner may need to ask some questions to help them stay focused on what you're saying, or they may need to jot down things, you know, uh, for later if there's things that you're reminding of them that they, and again, don't take these things personally. It's not that they're not paying attention to you, that is a strategy they have to use. You can use eye contact to make sure, sure your partner is engaged, but remember some adults with ADHD find eye contact uncomfortable. Again, this goes back to issues with social skills. We find a lot of these things um, actually can be quite similar to uh, autism traits where the there's that uncomfortability with eye contact again doesn't necessarily mean they're not listening uh, but again um, you know discuss this so you both understand where you're coming from you may need to use more direct shorter sentences um, again listen openly without judgment and try to take a walk in their shoes and understand where they're coming from. And allow for breaks. So when you're having a serious discussion, you know, um, both parties, but maybe more so the adult with ADHD may have difficulty staying focused for a longer period of time. So you may have to take breaks, come back to the discussion um, later, but again, discuss that so both parties understand that, you know, 
you're not walking or the other person is not walking out of the discussion, you're going to come back to it. And don't make assumptions for your partner's motivation. Um, again, uh, this is uh, trips people up a lot in their relationships. Things happen, things get uh, forgotten or misinterpreted and a lot of the destruction in the rela relationship is assuming your partner has done this intentional or was just too lazy or whatever it is you're assigning as motivation to them you may be totally incorrect and if you do say to them they may be totally shocked that you're interpreting that way and remember that it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. And those with ADHD can actually be very sensitive uh, to tone in one way. In another way, they can often not pick up the tone you're using. So again, be aware of the tone you're using. So let's move on to some organizational tips and strategies for a relationship. I talked about identifying both of your areas of strength and weaknesses. So use the individual strength and weaknesses to divide chores. You can use an individual uh, or joint organizational method for the family. What worked for our family way back when was a big laminated calendar on the fridge where everybody's um, appointment, whatever it was, um, was in a certain color. So each child had a certain color, certain color was uh, a family activity and each adult had a uh, color. So I or whoever could look at the calendar very frequently and say, you know, okay, um, John has drums, Eric has karate, Mike has this, you know, we, we could also, um, have a quick overview of the week. I realize things are much more electronic now. I'm not sure if there's a way to do that electronically, but this was very, very visual for the entire family to see. And it was done with uh, erasable markers. And then every month we did a new one. Uh, well, actually I did a new one because realize as the non-ADHD partner, that might be your job. So uh, remember again, that one, Partners or organizational strategies may feel very strange to the other partner and less than bottom line is whatever works for you works for you. Um, have designated spaces in the home for specific things that get lost like keys, electronic devices, mail, uh, bills to pay and um, practice it um, and practice it with your kids because the amount of time and stress that is lost with an ADHD family trying to find the keys as you're running out the door. Actually, Rick Green wrote a book on ADHD stole my car keys and he talks about being late to the shoot of his TV show almost every morning because he couldn't find his car car keys. So, and sometimes having a professional come in to help you organize the house and designate certain places for th certain things can be helpful. Developing a routine and schedule um, necessary 100% for families with ADHD. Obviously adults with ADHD generally also have kids with ADHD. So you're dealing with more than one member of the family. Using visual reminders, uh, posters, lists, a uh, reminder on the back of your front door, you know, backpacks, lunch, gym clothes, um, you know, telephone, whatever it is, cell phone, whatever it is that you've got to remember, you glance at it and do the checklist in your head as you're leaving the door. Uh, decreasing clutter. Um, again, you may need to bring in a professional to help declutter the house and also set up organizational strategies. Those with ADHD uh, may have great difficulty developing organizational strategies, but when things are put in place 
when there's a basket there that the keys always go into, et cetera, et cetera, they can follow it. So sometimes using a professional uh, helps. Uh, and using organizational things for bills and papers and all of those kind of things. Again, a professional can help with that. And sometimes week, weekly family meetings, maybe a Sunday afternoon to sit down and look at the schedule for the upcoming week, decide who's going to pick up, uh, you know, who, all those kind of things um, so they can be decided ahead of time. But remember, that doesn't mean the person with ADHD is automatically going to remember those at that meeting and you put in the electronic reminders, all of those strategies to help that person remember. Fighting about chores, we touched about this. Obviously, uh, you need to address the workload imbalance because if you don't, there will be resentment. Trade and divide chores, again, along strengths. So the partners need to feel that there's a somewhat equal balance, right? And agree on mutually acceptable ways to use reminders, be they list, post, post-its, verbal reminders. Another quick story about a couple. Um, they knew that the husband could use an ADHD coach, but they couldn't afford it. So they started using this system and uh, it actually uses a sense of humor as wife. So if the wife needed to remind him that something need to be, needed to be done, she said, this is your coach speaking. Remember that you got these bills to pay, uh, you know, by Friday. Um, and then she would say, this is your wife speaking. So it, it was humorous and funny, but it also took the sting out of the message. If she basically forwarded it with, this is your coach speaking instead of this is your wife, wife speaking. So again, there's so many ways to figure out how to navigate these things and using humor is, is sometimes one of the best ways. So um, I talked about splitting some charge with one person being the closer. Uh, generally, it's a non-ADHD person who has to be the, the closer to make sure, you know, uh, yes, the bills may be paid, but they may be sitting on the desk because they haven't been put in the mailbox or whatever. Um, I guess we don't do that. We do it online. But whatever, you know, you need to be done by a certain date. Remember that there may be some things that neither of you are good at, you know, be it bookkeeping, cleaning yard work. Well, sometimes actually hiring somebody to do those tasks may be uh, beneficial for re your relationship rather than continually arguing about them. And remember also, there may be two people in an, a relationship that have ADHD, right? So some of these things may need to be outsourced. And now we can automate a lot of things like grocery shopping, especially. In these days of COVID, we've learned to do so many more things um, online. Um, so some of these things may become very beneficial. And realize that if for whatever reason, one partner's had a heavier load for a while, the other partner should be cognizant of this and show their appreciation. Parenting, a big one. So um, untreated ADHD will find it near impossible to be a patient consistent parent if they're not diagnosed and treated. Why is this? It's their, um, their own ADHD impairments and very much their own emotional dysregulation, excuse me, will kick in. Remember that you need to parent as a team. Don't allow kids to divide and conquer. Kids with ADHD are particularly good at this. And arguing over parenting can become hugely detrimental to a relationship um, and also to the parent-child relationship. Um, you know, people who go into a relationship together may have very, very different 
experiences of being parented. And we don't generally, we're not taught parenting skills, although we, at Kadak, we have great um, courses for, for parents of kids with, with ADHD. And kids with ADHD um, will be much more challenging to parent and take more uh, effort. And especially when ODD, oppositional defiant disorder is thrown in there as well, it makes parents feel um, very unsecure uh, about their own parenting and causes a lot of arguments over parenting. So getting uh, a professional involved, taking parenting courses together, all can be very beneficial. But remember, if the adult with ADHD is not being treated, you're going to be spinning your wheel. So that's the first step. Um, and remember, adults with ADHD who take responsibility for their treatment and putting strategies in place make great role models for their children with ADHD. Who could relate better to a child with ADHD than a parent with ADHD? And the child with ADHD watching their parent do it correctly and putting in the effort. And even when they're not doing it correctly, being open and apologizing, what better role model can that child have? Remember to divide the parenting chores along strengths uh, as well. And also remember that one parent doesn't always want to be the bad guy, right? So divide the fun duties as well. Um, you know, uh, so, you know, you're both getting some of the, the more onerous tasks as well as the fun tasks. Some uh, tips on emotional outbursts and strategies. Medication can significantly help with emotional dysregulation, but you have to be very open and honest and discuss those issues. Uh, both partners need to become aware of the other person's triggers and signals. And you shouldn't expect that the non-ADHD partner is going to pick up on the subtle cues. So you have to be very open and honest as to how you're feeling. If the person with ADHD is becoming, you know, loud voice, scary in your face, you need to share that with them because they may not be aware of it. And you need to um, set up um, a strategy for having timeouts or a code word that you use to say stop or what are, you know I, I I need to go for a walk and cool down we can talk about it later but right now I'm feeling too overwhelmed and frustrated I can't deal with this and remember that you may actually have to get a professional involved in this so here's a bunch of references for a lot of this information that we've uh, that I presented for you. And uh, we've got some time for questions. So uh, Winita's, oh, Winita, uh, sorry, Fiona is going to, uh, hopefully she's gone through some of the questions you've put in. If you haven't and you would like to type in a question um, in the box, go ahead. And uh, Fiona is going to, um, present some of the questions to me and uh, I will do my best at answering them. Okay, Fiona. Yes, thank you, Heidi. And um, first question is how do you manage flash hack anger? Okay, yeah, so um, this emotional dysregulation can come in two ways. So um, the child or adult, um, can feel this sudden surge of overwhelming anger um, that kind of seems to come out of the blue. I mean, there's always a reason for it, but it just can be overwhelming. Or the other way is there can be a lot of sort of frustrations that build on top of each other that the adult with ADHD is not aware of. I remembered with our, um, our oldest son, uh, he actually didn't realize that numerous things had happened during the day because he was not aware of the signals his body was sending him. 
uh, that he was feeling frustrated and uh, angry. And it was this one thing that, you know, caused him to tip over and it was generally something his, his brother did. But then, of course, all hell would uh, break loose. And so part of it was teaching him things like when you're feeling, um, you know, your face is flushed, pressure on your chest, your hands are clenched, you're feeling stress and anxious, but you may not be aware of it. Sometimes catching it early, but you have to teach that person how to catch it early can help. Uh, but sometimes, yes, you can have uh, adults with ADHD and children with ADHD can have this overwhelming surge of emotions. And then it's a matter of uh, teaching and practicing skills uh, on what they need to do to distance themselves from others or catch it just before it's gotten to the point where there's a fist through the drywall or whatever it is. So if it's a matter of walking out, the, out of the house and going for a jog, having to put headphones on and listen to music, going to a quiet, dark place, whatever it is, but it's got to be done quickly. So some thoughts got to be put into this beforehand. It's got to be shared with uh, those around you so they know what's happening because you're not going to have the ability to be able to have a discussion about how you're feeling and you're being feeling overwhelmed. That's going to be too late. You just got to be able to put your hand up or whatever it is for a signal and say, I'm going for a run. And we teach kids with ADHD, uh, it's called kit in schools, it's called zones of regulation, where if they hold up a yellow card, it means I'm getting there. A red card is I've lost it. I've got to, I've got to go for, uh, you know, whatever, a run around the gym or whatever it is. So there's strategies, but you've got to put them in place beforehand and practice them. Okay, next question. Thank you. So regarding self-medicating with the argument, um, if engaging reinforces behavior and ignoring escalates it, so how is it best to deal with it um, constructively? So uh, basically, uh, both parties have to become aware of it. Um, you have to sit down and have some face-to-face -face discussions about this. Uh, because most likely the adult with ADHD is not aware of why they're doing it. So again, that education about the ADHD and how it's causing these things is so important. Because once they understand why they're doing this, you've got a much better chance at handling it constructively. So it's difficult for the non-ADHD partner to handle this all by themselves, because if they walk away, yes, it's just going to escalate it. And again, uh, very often um, getting a professional um, involved in this Um Having, you know, setting up some strategies beforehand after you've both discussed it, you know, to basically say, if I use this sentence or we have this signal, it means you're going there again. You know, you need to stop, you know, calm yourself down and try to, we've got to try to track tackle this another way. But again, it takes work. It's, it's not going to be solved overnight. Okay, so uh, regarding continual criticism, criticism um, how do you handle this when this is perceived um, due to RSD, uh, rejection sensitive dysphor uh, dysphoria, yeah, but yeah. it's actually not happening? Yes, so um, again, it's that, that open discussion that the adult with ADHD needs to understand that those overwhelming emotions to that criticism is a part, a symptom, an impairment of the ADHD. And they are 
more or less <laughs> choosing to interpret it in that way. And this is something that CBT can be very helpful with. So CBT actually challenges the negative thought patterns um, of adults with ADHD. So that knee-jerk reaction of the defensiveness or interpreting whatever is being said as a criticism when it isn't a criticism. CBT uh, teaches people to stop the negative thought when it happens and question it, um, you know, go back. And it could be just as simple as, you know, teaching them to say, um, I'm taking this as criticism. Is that how you mean it, right? So, but again, these things have got to be worked out um, in practice. And yes, yeah, sometimes it will take like CBT therapy um, or something like that to get uh, to get down to the bottom of it, so these strategies can be put in. Thank you. So, next uh, question: Does ADHD act the same as um, SCT disorder? Uh, sorry, as uh, sluggish cognitive temple disorder. Ah, okay, yes. So um, <laughs> that term is actually used by uh, Dr. Russell Barkley. So when we talk about ADHD, uh, the term ADHD is now used for all of the different presentations of ADHD, including what we used to think of as ADD. We don't use that term anymore. Um, that is the um, ADHD without the hyperactivity and impulsivity. Dr. Russell Barkley uh, believes that that type of ADHD is not actually ADHD, and he uses that term. So uh, most other medical professionals uh, consider it to be ADHD, the primarily inattentive profile. So uh, yeah, so we will see a lot of the same symptoms we talked about tonight. We will see in that presentation, but others we may see less. So the emotional dysregulation uh, in somebody with that presentation, we may see more as crying, right? Or um, getting very down on themselves rather than the outward um, anger, right? Or frustration. Uh, so we see the same emotional dysregulation. It just presents differently. All of the executive functioning impairments are going to be the same. The ADHD symptoms are going to be the same. The difficulty with following through, um, you know, procrastinating, not getting things done, um, the difficulty with consistent parenting, all of those things are still going to be consistent in the different presentations. But that's why I said at the beginning, it's very important for you to understand not just ADHD in general, but how ADHD impacts that specific individual because it will present quite differently in different people. Thank you. So um, is it possible to manage or control ADHD symptoms without SSRI or SNRI medications? So we don't use SSRI medications for ADHD. Um, those are actually uh, antidepressant medications. And we have a big problem with adults, more often women, but not exclusively, being misdiagnosed with having depression and anxiety or correctly diagnosed with having depression and anxiety, but the underlying ADHD has not been diagnosed. So frequently, um, physicians who are not experts in ADHD will treat with antidepressant medication and anti-anxiety medication. It's not what we treat ADHD with. If you have a coexisting anxiety or depression, that's fine. And we always, again, that's why we want that thorough assessment and diagnosis to understand what's going on. So that treatment may be fine for part of the problem, but if you truly have ADHD, then you need ADHD medications, which are 
Um, most often stimulant medication, but there are some non-stimulant ADHD medications as well. There is a webinar uh, you can access on our website on treatment for ADHD, which goes through um, all the, the different types of medication and how they work and that type of thing. You can access that. There's also information on the website um, on different uh, medications as well under the treatment drop down that you can have a look at. Thank you. So um, how do you suggest working on issues um, that bother one partner and the other partner just can't do it all the time? Yeah, sorry. So it's the, it's the non-ADHD partner who, I mean, who's being bothered and the partner with ADHD who's not being bothered? Is that, did I get that right? Um, I didn't specify in the- um, Okay, okay. Yeah, so basically, I mean, these situations come up in relationships, whether you've got ADHD or not, but probably more so because adults with ADHD and children with ADHD, anybody with ADHD is, they, is not as perceptive as to how what they're doing impacts others, right? They're not perceptive of their own impairments. That's when we, why, when we do assessments for ADHD um, adults, we generally also have significant others or um, their parents or a good friend also do the rating scales because sometimes we see great <laughs> discrepancy, right? Uh, generally, the adult with ADHD will score themselves as having less impairments. So again, um, speaking with uh, medical professionals um, as a couple, um, sometimes, um, you know, looking into marriage therapy with an expert in ADHD, um, but this can be helpful to to get both parties to understand each other's perspective. And um, basically just bringing home that, you know, if your partner, if this is really causing your problems, your partner difficulties, uh, if they're getting frustrated, whatever, believe me in the long run, it's gonna cause you problems as well. So uh, both, parties are better off dealing with it um, and finding a solution, not laying blame, finding a solution to the problem rather than ignoring it because bottom line, it's just gonna get worse. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, what to do if one person has ADHD and the other one has OCD? Ah, interesting combination. Um, you know, sometimes when we don't treat ADHD, it flips into OCD. Not always, but you can have OCD without ADHD. But um, yeah, I can see that being in, an issue, especially if the person with uh, ADHD has difficulty with organizational skills and messiness and the person with OCD, if that's how their OCD uh, presents. Obviously, uh, both of them getting assessed, diagnosed, and treated uh, is going to be very helpful. Uh, CBT for both parties can be very helpful. Uh, CBT can be very helpful for um, OCD. And again, uh, we've got adults with OCD who are in denial and again, the same sort of issues with it's not a big deal, let me just do my compulsive behaviors or have my compulsive thoughts or whatever and leave me alone, but it's going to impact the relationship just as much as the ADHD impacts the relationship. So one getting treated without the other being treated is not going to work. So both parties need to get assessed, diagnosed, treated, make sure everything is looked at and assessed so we get comprehensive profiles. Then we can put the proper strategies in, in place. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned that you used a calendar for your family. So can you share how you set that up? Um, 
Right. Okay. So and I'm not, I, you must be able to still get these things online. So it was a large um, laminated calendar that was probably about two feet by three feet or three feet by three feet. And it had a grid um, of a month, but no dates on. So for each month, you could just erase it and fill it in for the next month. So you wrote the you wrote the dates on for the day of that month, and each member of the family had a specific color of marker that was designated to them. So one son, everything in red. If they glanced at it, they would know that those were their their lessons they had to go to whatever was put on there that pertained to them. So each child had a particular color, each adult had a particular color. And then when there were family, um, you know, activities, they were another color. So it allowed me to look at each day quickly um, to figure out who had what. But then it also obviously took a certain amount of training and prodding to get the kids and my husband also to use it. But in time, it just became a habit that they would glance at it. And nobody could use the excuse that, well, I didn't know we were going to grandma's this weekend. And it was like, you know what the strategy is. Before you book something, you look at the calendar and see what's booked for you or the family um, as a group. So it was relatively, uh, you know, easy to set up. And uh, if something had to be, um, you know, put on for the, the next uh, week, obviously, the calendar, as most calendars allowed, uh, you know, a few days into the next month, or you could make notes down at, at the bottom. So it was just very helpful because it was very, very visual and in everybody's face. So, uh, and just walking by it would be that visual reminder. Oh yeah, I got to check what I've got to do tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does alcohol make ADHD worse? Yes. Well, what it makes worse is it decrease, decreases uh, inhibitions, right? So, uh, it, and people with ADHD generally have difficulty uh, with inhibitions, right? Because there's the impulsivity, they generally will not slow down to think of the consequences of this is just a part of ADHD. Their brain races, there's impulsivity, they get a thought in their mind, they do the deed, and then afterwards it dawns on them that mm, that might not have been that such a good thing to do, right? So uh, alcohol, unfortunately, makes that worse, right? Because inhibitions, um, you know, are worse. Uh, we know it is not good for brain functioning. It is not good for depression. It's just not good for a lot of things. But people with ADHD have much higher instances of alcohol use and alcohol abuse, right? It's called self-medicating. We also know that uh, people are, you know, um, actually adolescents with ADHD, again, have the same issues with alcohol, but adolescents and adults um, both also have significant issues with self-medicating with marijuana. Um, unfortunately, uh, both uh, make focus, attention, all of those things, those symptoms of ADHD worse. Um, we think that those with ADHD are drawn to the pot and alcohol, obviously, because it numbs some of those feelings. And you can also think of, you know, if you've got a racing brain that's constantly on and you cannot relax, pot is going to help you do that. It's going to help your brain shut off and relax. Unfortunately, it also has a lot of downsides for uh, people with ADHD. Thank okay. you. So if um, 
the partner with ADHD attend some individualized therapy, so either like CBT or coaching. So yes. how can the non-ADHD partner participate in their partner's treatment process? Uh, generally, um, CBT and coaching are individual type therapies. Um, generally, that's something the partner does not um, go to, at least all of the sessions. Now, if um, it would be helpful for the partner to understand what their partner has learned in the CBT therapy or the strategies a coach is suggesting be implemented. Um, obviously some individual joint sessions, right? Can be booked, right? For the, the coach or the um, psychologist who's doing CBT to be able to share those things with the partner. But the adult with ADHD has got to consent for that, right? Um, it's got to be, uh, they've got to initiate it to say, would you mind if my partner comes in for a session so we can share some of the highlights of what I've learned or some of the strategies we're going to be put in place? Thank you. Um, so can you talk about how um, ADHD has changed in your children as they got older? And um, the other question is, how do you help a teenager with a lack of self-esteem? Oh, those are two really big questions. Uh, <clears throat> so how ADHD uh, has changed? Well, I, I actually do a presentation on um, children going into adolescence with ADHD, adolescents going into adult with it, adulthood and ADHD, and we talk about the transitions a lot. So... As adolescents become adulthood, yes, very often that outward hyperactivity can decrease. Sometimes the impulsivity can decrease or change how it's manifesting. Um, but remember, uh, the impulsivity and hyperactivity and all that stuff, uh, emotional dysregulation has bigger consequences the older they get. So my boys uh, had a unique uh, presentation. All three of them were gifted with ADHD, which, you know, sounds good, but also had its own drawbacks. Um, they did all finally get through post-secondary. There were some bumps and starts and stops and starts. Uh, our middle one has ADHD and anxiety, so that impacted him a lot. Um, the anxiety has never gone away in adulthood, although um, he has found um, a lot more ways to deal with it. Um, interestingly enough, our oldest, who probably uh, had the most sort of visual outward signs of ADHD, um, has found his niche, um, is doing great, he married two kids, you know, doing wonderfully. Um, so very often the, the outward hyperactivity and impulsivity is not what causes the most lifelong impairments. When you have ADHD with other disorders like learning disabilities and anxiety, and actually um, my one grandson has been diagnosed with ADHD and autism, and two of um, my other sons, as they've gotten, learned about this, see some of the autism characteristics in themselves, although they were never um, diagnosed with autism or probably would have had the symptoms to that degree that they would have been. But um, again, it's very interesting to follow the paths of my sons, obviously, in the time I have spent doing this over, I've do, been doing this for close to 30 years now. So, um, you know, started with local support groups, developed CADAC, um, was executive director for CADRA for many years while I built CADAC volunteer. So the more I've learned, the more it's been interesting as they've grown to have discussions with them about their ADHD, because they can now tell me, you know, 
how their brain works. Um, our oldest son many years ago said to me, mom, remember those knockdown drag out fights we used to have when I was 16, 17? And I said, oh yeah. And he said, he said, you know what? He said, I'd get halfway through that fight and I wouldn't remember what we were fighting about, but I'd be damned if I'd let you win. And I said, you know, in retrospect, all these little things they share with me now, um, you know, are very educational. So, you know, um, they're there, uh, you know, they're all working, they've got their families, um, but has ADHD gone away? No, uh, you know, it's still there. Um, and uh, has ADHD gone away from my husband, uh, gone away from my husband? No, it's still there. And uh, the, the big difference is uh, he understands it now um, much, much better. So that, that is actually what's causing improvement um, all around for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, how can someone support um, the spouse if he just got the... Um, 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 uh, Diagnosis? Yes, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Uh, okay, so again, um, the best way you can support your spouse is to learn about ADHD. And obviously, you learn about it together. Um, he, she is probably going through a lot of emotions right now. We find that adults with ADHD, the later in life you get diagnosed, the more emotions. Um, they generally go through a journey of questioning, resentment, why was this not uh, discovered earlier? They go back and look at their life about all the negative messages they were given, the judgment, the blame, you know, how it led to their feelings about themselves. That brings up a whole lot of emotions. At the same time, it can be, you know, bring up a lot of, you know, hope. And, you know, now that I know that what's going on, um, things can get better and helping them focus on that. I mean, you've got to let them go through that journey of the past. Uh, you know, they, they've got to go through it and, and, you know, reconcile themselves with it. Uh, but then uh, learning about it together, learning about, you know, what the impairments are, what trips up you know, your spouse on the daily, uh, and then learning about the strategies and all the ways, things we can do to put in to help people with ADHD these days, accommodations in the workplace, accommodations in post-secondary, all kinds of uh, things. But again, that's the way you can help support them, learn with them. And then work as a team to put in, uh, you know, treatment strategies, daily household strategies, work strategies, relationship strategies, all of those things. Thank you. Um, can you make any suggestions for finding a therapist who can evaluate an adult for uh, possible ADHD? Yeah, so we have a huge issue with a lack of uh, professionals to assess ADHD, but uh, CADAC has some resource lists. So what you need to do is contact uh, the office, just go to the website, just go CADAC, C-A-D-D-A-C. You'll find uh, the phone number or email address for the website. Um, you'll have to share with them what area you're in and they'll be able to send you the resource list of the professionals we know of in your area for ADHD. Thank you. Um, so how, what can I do to prepare my teen boys with uh, ADHD to be ready to be the best partners they can be? Ah, again, educate them about ADHD. And you know what? Um, educate your children as well as your adolescents but we've got some great resources for adolescents so um there's a toolkit in transitioning to post-secondary there is, there's a series of five videos of adolescents speaking about their own adhd how it has impairments, how it uh, has impaired them in certain ways and strategies they put in place uh, to, 
you know, to be uh, helpful. And that's specifically geared uh, to adolescents because they can listen to other adolescents speaking um, about their ADHD. Tons of resources on the website. Of If any of you have got children with ADHD, we have a three-part webinar, uh, three-part, sorry, animated video series that explains ADHD to children with ADHD. Um, so again, there's also uh, a webinar on um, helping adolescents transition where we talk about um, tips on how to teach your child uh, what they need to do to become an adult. So, you know, getting them how to practice to make a meal, go grocery shopping, doing the laundry, um, you know, monitoring uh, their own medical uh, appointments. And again, it's a process. You can't expect them to do this at 15, but you start to teach them. So when they get to, you know, 19, 20, 21, and we know adolescents with ADHD will be, um, take longer to mature, right? So they're in, and, and listen, all of the, the impairments they have in executive functioning are not magically gonna go away. They can be improved on, but they will generally probably add on, you know, end up with them. So you can access those resources um, on our website. I'm actually going to be uh, launching two courses, one for parents of children with ADHD and also one for parents of adolescents with ADHD. The information's on our website. We've already got two programs of the child one totally filled up. But all of that information is there, great resources. And we actually have a spot on the website with information specifically for adolescents with ADHD as well. Thank you, Heidi. Um, so three more questions. Um, uh, one question is, um, my partner was recommended to stop his medication until blood work for another health issue has been assessed. And now he feels like he may not want to go back on his medication. So um, CBT, um, you know, this person has heard of CBT for children, but would that work for an adult and allow him to take lower dosage of these uh, stimulant? Okay. What other options do we have? Yeah, so research actually tells us that CBT is not very helpful for children uh, because they don't have very much insight. <laughs> Um, into their own, own functioning and behaviors, it has been shown successful for adults. And again, the research shows that when we use it in combination with medication, it's specifically um, a successful. So, um, you know, uh, it would be interesting for uh, your significant other with ADHD to do what we call a medication trial and sometimes physicians can put this in place with a pharmacist um, you know that uh, do a trial for a couple of weeks um, you know on medication um, have them do rating scales have people around them do rating scales including people at work whatever uh, and then do a trial off medication and get other people to comment, not just the significant other with ADHD. And then, you know, rate it. Uh, is the medication uh, beneficial or not? Regardless of that, CBT can be very helpful, um, you know, for the ADHD. We sometimes find the CBT programs are not as helpful when they're not on medication because it's more difficult for them to focus and pay attention on the course. So whatever way you want to do it first, the CBT without medication or do a trial on the medication before, because remember CBT is not covered by uh, OHIP or whatever prov province you're in. It's not covered by um, uh, provincial health care plans. It's generally out of pocket. It can be very expensive. So if you do go into it, you want to make sure uh, it's as successful as, as can be. Thank you. So do you see a link between ADHD and high functioning autism? And what is the biggest different, uh, difference between the two? 
Ah, so uh, ADHD um, comes frequently with a lot of different disorders. So we know that there's a very, very high rate of ADHD in people with autism, which <clears throat> high functioning autism, we used to call Asperger's, now we just call it high functioning autism. Uh, it also comes with things like bipolar, Tourette syndrome. Um, so we also know there's a lot of crossover in symptoms and the uh, genetic research that's going on. Uh, we also see a lot of link links and crossover in the genes for a lot of the neurodevelopmental disorders. So a lot of the, the symptoms that I talked about, um, the emotional dysregulation, um, the issues with social skills, a lot of the in executive functioning impairments like organization, um, being able to follow lists um, of instructions, time management, uh, problem solving, what we call, excuse me, I've been talking too much, working memory, all of those things uh, we see in both disorders. And it's um, not infrequent that we have a diagnosis of ADHD and we will talk about the the child or an adult being a little aspergery or, you know, it means that they have some of those symptoms and tendencies, but may not have it to a full blown degree that they would qualify for a diagnosis or they may actually have both disorders. The new DSM-5 has changed that it does allow a dual diagnosis of autism and um, ADHD. And it is sometimes helpful for the adult to go for an assessment for autism if they think that is occurring as well. Of course, autism doesn't have medication all, uh, to treat it, although we are finding when there's uh, both ADHD and autism in children, we are finding ADHD medication can be very helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The last question for the night. Um, people with uh, ADHD have issues with a uh, specific neurotransmitter? Okay, that, that is a whole uh, hour lecture on its <laughs> own, actually. So, you know, the new research, we used to think <coughs> that it was just uh, the frontal lobe in the brain uh, that uh, causes ADHD. The new research sh has shown us that uh, more than that, it seems to be more than one areas of the brain and researchers are now thinking it's actually uh, the way those parts of the brain send signals to each other, right? So they have seen uh, from different neuroimaging, different parts of the brain being affected with those with ADHD. We know that it's both dopamine and nor uh, adrenaline that um, is implemented in ADHD as, as you know, um, as well as other things. And again, this is groundbreaking, um, you know, research that uh, you can Google it actually, um, but make sure you actually get onto reputable uh, medical uh, websites talking about this, because if you Google it, uh, you will actually be able to find um, reports on different research studies on MRIs, brain imaging, all kinds of different things, genetic research on ADHD um, that we're finding these days. Okay, so if that was the last question, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for tonight. I'm sorry, it's been a long presentation, uh, but wanted to stick around for uh, all of your questions. And again, remember to go to the website. Also, I just wanted to remind everybody, we do have an education advocacy campaign going on right now. And I would really, really encourage you all to go uh, to the website. Uh, you'll see it on the homepage, click on it. And literally within 
three to four minutes, you can send a tweet or email to your elected official as well as your minister uh, of education. It's really that easy and we really need the voices of people with ADHD, families impacted with ADHD to be heard on these issues. So thanks very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.